going to for a bike ride, a walk, or something, but you came. Good music already. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you. Marianne, thank you, Pryor. Um, I have to announce by, by rule that we have a session meeting on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in the parlor. I want to uh, alert everybody to an announcement in the bulletin. Ordinarily on fifth Sundays, we don't worship in this sanctuary, but this uh, October 30th, this fifth Sunday, we will be doing a special Reformation Sunday worship service. Um, I don't know if you have ever participated in a pageant of the banners, um, but we're gonna do a modified version of that. Um, our denomination has a lot of confessional creeds that we look at subordinate standards. Um, it's a visually important and, and I think, I personally think, studying worship service. So hopefully that you will find that to be the case for yourselves. Um, lots of people to pray for and over. Um, today we welcome back Connie Kelly. You can see, she's here. <laughs> Yay, thank you God. Um, and we're getting, it's that time of year. Presbyterian has sent out their per capita uh, letter. Um, Craig Howard sent a really good letter. Um, talking about the stuff that's happening with our per capita dollars for the Presbytery. Um, in 2022, just highlights. In 2022, the Presbytery provided over $450,000 in congregational support and grants. These funds help the congregations cover the cost of ministry, um, healthcare, book drives, celebrations, and evangelism. And he said, while continuing to pro in promote anti-racism, the Presbyterian has extended its mission into anti-gun violence and to support, into support for migrants from Texas. Um, he's grounding that in Micah 6 8. He says, the Presbyterian of Chicago takes seriously the vision to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Um, for the details, though, um, this year's per capita apportionment um, is going up 50 cents. It's the first time in three years that per capita has gone up. Um, and it comes like this, up to $36.50. The Presbytery of Chicago gets $22.84. The Synod of Lincoln Trails, which is the mid-level um, uh, level of governance of our church, and the mission branch of our church is $3.81. And our General Assembly, that thing we do every couple of years is nine dollars and eighty-five cents. So I think when you think about the general assembly level with Presbyterian disaster assistance and all the things that the church does, it's cheaper than a night out for dinner in Chicago. You know, I went to a corner bakery the other day and spent forty bucks on lunch. And I was like, hmm, think about that. It's really important. Ellen, I made a coffee and put it on your desk. If somebody wants to talk more about that besides me, that would be really great. It is also that time of year you're thinking about stewardship. Are there other announcements today? Hearing none, let's worship the Lord. Our call to worship today is taken from Psalm 119. Please join me in a responsive call to worship, which you will find in your book. Teach me, Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Be gracious to me 
according to your word. James. Remember James? And um, 
Jessica's gonna kill me. That's Jessica, everybody, and her husband, Eric. And Jessica is one of our preschool teachers. So I wanted to introduce her to those who aren't around during the day, Monday through Friday, and don't have that great information. So, I'm glad you're here today. And I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad all those other people are here today, too. Um, so I've been sitting up here doing these messages with kids for a long, long time. And I'm kind of doing a repeat one today. And I remembered when I was planning it that when I did this so many years ago, that this boy is now um, done with college, <laughs> this was his favorite animal. And we were looking at it and going, what? It's a vulture. Do you know what a vulture is? Definitely no, it's not your favorite animal. Or definitely no, you don't know what a vulture is. So it's a kind of a big bird that's really pretty ugly. It doesn't have any feathers on its head or neck because its job is to eat dead animals. Oh yeah. And I'm going somewhere with this. I promise. I'm going to start by reading you something from the beginning of the Bible beginning of the Bible, it's Genesis. Um, Genesis 1, and I'm going to start with verse 20. So, in the beginning of the Bible, God is creating everything. Okay? And, we, and he did one thing each day, and we're going to start with day 5. So, on day 5, God said, let the water be filled with living things, and let birds fly in the air above the earth. God created large sea animals, every living thing that moves in the sea. The sea is filled with those living things, with each one producing more of its own kind. He also made every bird that flies, and each bird produced more of its own kind. God saw that this was good. God blessed them and said, Have many young ones, so that you may grow in number. Fill the water of the seas, and let the birds grow in number on the earth. Then the evening passed, and morning came, and that was the fifth day. And God said, let the earth be filled with animals, each producing more of its own kind. Let there be tame animals and small crawling animals and wild animals, and let each produce more of its own kind. And so it happened. And God made wild animals and tame animals and all the small crawling animals to produce more of their own kind. And God saw this was good. So I think when we think about animals, we think about the cute ones. Right? Cats. What else is cute besides cats? Puppies, especially chihuahuas. That's what you're planning to paint, right? So um, after worship, we're going to paint pictures of animals and at 11 o'clock. And adults are welcome to come too if you want. Um, but you know, God also created those vultures and mosquitoes and sharks. Hey James, any idea why God would create a shark? Yeah. Or a mosquito? Who likes mosquitoes? Oh no, definitely not you. Or a scorpion, or a vulture, right? God created even those animals because the, even those animals have a really important job. God gave every animal on this earth a really important job and our really important job is to love all God's animals even the ones that maybe we think are a little icky or are a little harmful to us because they still have an important job for God's earth. So my buddies, I'm thinking that sometimes people can be like mosquitoes and annoying or like sharks and snappy and biting or like vultures and a little bit gross. But if God created all those animals and wants us to love all those animals, I bet he wants us to love all those people too. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of your creatures, not just the cute ones and the ones that are easy to love, but even the ones that we have to look closer at and appreciate their qualities and what they bring to our world and to our lives. Let us remember that you command us to love them all. Amen. Go up and down the 
these stairs. I take a little more care than I really need to. I'm not as feeble as I look, but I don't want to fall. So I probably take a little more care than necessary. Forgive me for doing that because it slows us down. Thank you. Please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant us ears to hear your story in this verse of scripture. Grant us eyes to see the state of our lives and in the mirror. Grant us hearts of strength and courage to find your will for us. Grant us the power to do your will. Grant us the grace of obedience until your will is done. All this we ask through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture is a reading from Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8. This is the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He, Jesus, said, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he, the judge, refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, says the Lord, says God, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of the Lord.
Our second lesson comes from Paul's second lesson, letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 10 through chapter 4, verses 5. Sounds longer than it really is, thanks be to God. <laughs> Please listen once again for the word of the Lord for you. Timothy writes to, Paul writes to Timothy, Now, you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, and my persecutions, and my sufferings. The things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, Continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. <coughs> All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound teaching, but having their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, be sober in everything. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. So I don't usually pay much attention between the themes of one passage of scripture on a given lectionary Sunday versus the themes of another. But I would like to point out for those of you that follow along in the lectionary and ponder uh, what's read on a given Sunday for the remainder of the week, there's an interesting contrast here between the judge who admits he doesn't fear God and respects anybody. So you already know that he is self-aware um, and honest about who he's in, who's living his life for, and it's himself. But Paul is saying something completely different. He's saying something completely different to us. And before I even get started on my sermon, I want to invite you, in preparation for Re Reformation Sunday, and even for today, I want you to think about five people in your life who have taught you the most about being Christians. I want you to write their names down somewhere where you can see them on a post-it note. And think about who they were as personalities, if they were alike, if they were dissimilar, and what exact thing about being a Christian they taught you. I hope that will be a fruitful exercise for you. Now, you will notice in your order of worship, otherwise known as the Ordo, that there is a sermon title called Charge, Charging, and Spent. How many of y'all think of a credit card? Credit card. Charge, charging, and spent. Credit card. Some of you mechanical types. Batteries. Yeah, right? Winter's coming in Chicago, right? That's what I was thinking about. I actually think about horses. They are charged. When you put a horse to the task, even when they take them out in the morning, they're excited, especially in the 
are. They hide onto it in the air, and the horses throw their heads around, and they prance, and they skitter sideways. Horses are charged, and they love to do their work. They love to charge, and they love to, well, some horses at least, horses that I used to work with, love to run and jump. And they would run and jump so hard, they would spend themselves in playing. Children do that. Lovers do that. But I was thinking about Paul being a war horse for the church. And my brain being weird, I started thinking about war horses. And then I started thinking about something that happened when I was a young girl at the Anne Arundel uh, County um, Fairgrounds in Maryland. Anybody know that the state sport of Maryland does anybody know what the state sport is of Maryland? Just by a weird horse racing. Sorry? Horse racing? No, close. We do have the Preakness. The first state sport. Maryland was the first state in our union to pick a state sport. Would you be surprised to know that it's jousting? <laughs> <laughs> in 1960, the, uh, for the lawyer types, in 1960, it was brought up, but it took till 1962 to make the chapter 134 in the General Provisions Code, section 7, 329A. In uh, the late 80s, I think, I think it was the late 80s, we added a more egalitarian sport, lacrosse. So Maryland has two state sports, one for the privileged and maybe the elite people who, anyway, and Cross. Everybody can play lacrosse. And how many people like to beat each other over the head with a stick? <laughs> anyway, the world's oldest equestrian sport was developed in the Middle Ages as combat training for cavalry. There is a connection between that and Christianity, just in case you want to know. Even though we did take out armored Christian soldiers from our handbook, right? Two armored combatants on horses charged at each other, trying to knock the other off of horse. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Sounds like me and me. <laughs> Eventually, though, jousting lost its military connection. It became a popular sport with people who had horses, which, like yachtsmen, also means time and money. Think kings, knights, nobles, people with leader, people who like to push the envelope, so to speak. Jousting, though, has been popular in Maryland since colonial times, but it became even more popular after the Civil War. That sounds weird too. Why would jousting become more popular at the Civil War? People are aggressive. We work it out in lots of different ways, right? But we don't, in Maryland at least, I was excited as a teenager to go to this um, state fairgrounds because my, my grandparents and my dad knew that I loved horses so much. So I went to the Chesapeake uh, Pony uh, the Aztec Island Pony Swim and I got to go to the jousting tournament, and I got to go to lots of horse shows, and, and it's just really a cool way to grow up. And you go to the, it's called a ring tournament, it's not really even called, it is a jousting tournament, but you don't knock people off horses anymore. They use a long, fine tip lance, I mean it's really long, like, depending on the size of the rider at least, they have a really fine tip lance, and the riders do charge a horse at full gallop through an 80 yard course, and the rings are suspended from strings. And the whole idea is to stick your lance through those holes. And the more rings you get on your lance, the more points you get. Now, the, the rings are equally spaced, and they're hung from arches, kind of like this, and they're hung at a specific height. Tuni, how tall are you? Yeah. 6'2". 6'2". So imagine seven inches above Steve's head. So the rings are hung at six feet nine inches above the ground, and they raise in range and diameter from a quarter of an inch. That's really tiny, really exacting, to nearly two inches. I think I can manage two inches, but I know very good and well. I will never get good enough. I just don't have the eye hand coordination, right? <sighs> imagine that. Being so skilled that you can put a lance in a tip of a ring that is a quarter of an inch wide. That's pretty amazing. So the size of the rings depends on the skill level of the contestant. And would you believe it when I say little teeny kids on Shetland ponies do this? How cool is that? Right? Jousting is a family sport. Frequently, skills and animals are passed from one generation. 
generation to another, those animals are highly, highly trained and they're very, very valuable. So if this is at all interesting to you, it happens at the Anne Arundel Fairgrounds in Crownsville, Maryland on the first Saturday every October. So anyway, just thought you might like to know. So if that is the theme, that's the driving metaphor that I'm seeing in Paul's letter, I know that it's not your driving letter, but hopefully I can make the case. Charge. When one goes to the fairgrounds in the morning, the horses and the riders are charged up with excitement, with fitness, and with optimism. Those are good words. Excitement, fitness, optimism. The teams have been preparing for this one day literally for years. Humans and horses are as ready for the day as they can expect to be ready. It's a pretty good metaphor for the church, right? This is exactly where Paul's protege, Timothy, is standing. He is fit for ministry, he's excited about ministry, and he's optimistic. And Paul pumps him up, but Paul also levels him up. The stirrups are equal on both sides, so he can keep his balance. He's getting lasting instructions from his teacher, an exemplar of the Christian faith. Man, I'm reading this passage for Timothy, and I'm thinking, man, Paul, you're just like this judge. I want you to pay attention to who I am. Ministry is always not about what you say or what you do. Those things are important, but those are two legs of the stool. Ministry is about who you are. It's about what you do and what you say, but it's mostly about who you are. And Paul says, I want you to learn from my life, my conduct, my teaching, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, and my troubles. Church, Paul, Timothy, everybody else, and us, I want you to learn from all this stuff for a reason. Timothy and Paul know what's ahead of him. He knows the importance of his place in his work, and Paul hands him the baton. If Paul was standing in front of you saying, hey, pay attention to everything that I've taught you, here's the time, would you take it? Because that's our task. If you knew it was going to hurt, would you do it? Paul's leg of the race is now complete. It is time for Timothy to carry on the teaching and the missional work of Christian leadership. So we got the charge part. You know, this is, this is Paul's letter of goodbye. If you read the whole thing, you'll get the goodbye part clearly. So we got the charge part, now we get the charging part. And Paul's very clear here. He says the scriptures were written for people that were listening and looking and seeking something else than what the world was offering, than what the world was selling. They were seeking otherness, connection, holiness, and answers to question like, how are we to live with each other? And for what are we alive? And Paul and Timothy want to make us wise for salvation. He says it to Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you have learned it. Now you know why I asked you about the five people, right? Five people in your life have taught you something. Write them down. Honor them in your prayers. If they're not living anymore, pray for them. Because they're still fighting for you. Paul and Timothy want to make us wise for salvation. We are independent, educated, lucky people. What do we need saving from? <laughs> Serious answer, Steve. Thank you. They want to make us wise for salvation. Their method is more than a lifestyle. Their method is the inspiration of scripture. Now, maybe I'm speaking for you in a way that I should not be, but if I'm really honest about myself, sometimes even to my ears, that sounds just about as antiquated as jousting. Is there an amen in this building? <laughs> scripture sounds antiquated. The language sounds antiquated, the metaphors seem antiquated, and it takes work to put yourself there. But I still believe with all my heart
heart that if I do the work to put myself there, I find that I am already there. I just didn't notice it before. Perhaps this is because we as a people, as a community, and as a society have spent too much time asking of Scripture questions it was never meant to answer. So we have charged and charging. But here comes the spent part. Paul's at the end of his life, I don't know how long Paul lived. I don't know how old he was when he died. I don't think anybody knows how old he was when he died. But to me, he seems like he's somewhere in his late 60s. By all the things that he suffered and the few um, descriptions of him, I, I, I get the feeling he's somewhere in his late 60s. And Paul spent. And part of the reason why he spent is because he went from place to place, which was arduous in the day. Part of why he was spent is because not only was he traveling from place to place, he was working to support himself by sharing the messages with the churches that he was trying to start and, and, and carry, which is to say that Paul really was a tent maker. He was a leather smith, and he earned his living wages from those tasks and from the benevolences of churches who understood the importance of his work. But Paul was spent because prison was no joke. Getting beaten and thrashed was no joke. Again, I ask you, would you take the baton if you knew it was going to hurt? This isn't, this, this faith of ours isn't for the weak of will. Paul is spent, but he loves Christ. He had a life-changing experience, a direct life-changing experience of Christ. He went from being a persecutor of the church to the church's greatest benefactor. So I ask you, are you charged? Are you charging? Or are you spent? Because those words aren't just about horses and batteries and credit cards. They're about people, and they're about our faith. Here ends the reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, our hymn, our hymn of response is number 475, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead.
that you have received. Go out into the world willing to share it. Go out into the world and stand by the weak. Support the suffering. Comfort the lonely and the afflicted. Visit the imprisoned. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. And always, wherever you go, love one another. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the power of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, now and forever. Amen.